uh, what I forgot to mention is on the board. Why do we offer sacrifice? What's the purpose? Four purposes. Adoration, reparation, thanksgiving, and petition. Oddly enough, these are the four themes of prayer. Adoration, reparation, thanksgiving, and petition. That's it. Everything falls into one or more of those categories. And so, sacrifice, first and foremost, is about adoration. Now, Scripture calls it fear of the Lord. I prefer to call it wonder and awe in the presence of God. Adoration is about mystical experience. To be in the presence of the transcendent that does not depend upon space and time. Um, wonder and awe in God's presence. Praising God simply because God is God. Um, one of my favorite lines from the Psalms about angels. Adore the Lord, all you his angels, you mighty in strength who do his bidding. that to be in the presence of God immediately, like the angels are, means that they see the intrinsic good of God's will and want to do it. And that's where adoration fits into our prayer life. To behold the intimate and ultimate good of what God intends and to want to do that simply because it is good. Um, reparation. We are sinners. And it's important that we have a sense that forgiveness is not the ultimate goal. That forgiveness opens the way to repentance. You know, we, we hear from the television preachers all the time that, you know, I've been forgiven of my sins. And? Well, I've been forgiven of my sins. And? What is why does that make a difference? Because now I want to get better. And I have a plan. You know, the desire to get better is, you know, that's a bar stool affirmation. Uh, but you got to get off the bar stool to do something about it. And so reparation is not just an acknowledgement of sinfulness. It's about making up for that by getting better. Uh, how do you do that? You have a plan. When people come to the sacrament of penance, that's why I'm there. To help people come up with a plan so that the next time they come to confession, they don't tell me the same thing. That they get better. And I always tell them, Give this a try. If it doesn't work, come back. Tell me I'm all wet. We'll try something else. But that's my role. God forgives right away. I'm there to help people find out how to deal with forgiveness. Reparation is having the plan to get better. Thanksgiving. Uh, when I was growing up, 
My parents taught me how to write thank you notes and made sure that I concentrated on how important the person is and not the gift. And Thanksgiving is the same. If it's truly Thanksgiving, it's about more than just the gift. It also has to be about the person who has given the gift. And which is more important, the gift or the person? I hope it's the person. And if we appreciate the person, we'll appreciate the gift, and therefore the, the motive of the person who gave the gift will be fulfilled. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. It's not about turkey and cranberry sauce. Now hear this. Petition. <clears throat> Unfortunately, most of our prayer is laden with petition. We besiege heaven asking for stuff all the time. Jesus encourages us to pray the prayer of petition, but not just for ourselves. The most important prayer of petition is, is the prayer for the good of the neighbor because that means that we're paying attention to the teacher. And St. Paul tells us that God already knows what we need. What he really wants to hear from us are two things. Number one, What are we going to do with what we already have? What's our plan for what we already have? And if we have a plan for what we already have, we'll know whether this particular petition is really for our good or just for our pleasure. Secondly, God wants to know whether what we're asking for is going to be good for our neighbor as well as ourselves. And that's not always part of the picture at all. So the prayer of petition first and foremost has its value when we're concerned about the good of others. And secondly, whether what we're asking for for ourselves is also going to be a blessing for the good of others, not just for me. These are the four purposes of sacrifice. They're the four purposes of prayer. And they're all important, but they are in order. So what is most important? The most important prayer is adoration, wonder and awe in God's presence. Two, thank you. Wow, look what we got. Reparation. I'm sorry. Here's my plan to keep it from happening again. And then petition. Um, we've got to really move out into the top three uh, and stop overloading the bottom one, uh, but that's the way we are. This is Adam and Eve talking through us. Um, it's the, not just a question of being satisfied with what we already have, but having the same mind which is in Christ Jesus. And our prayer should draw us closer to that, not only to know it, but to understand it. Um, 
there's a difference between knowledge and understanding. Knowledge is about factual reality. <clears throat> understanding is what it's for. <laughs> what do we do with this? Um, and our goal is a virtue, the virtue of wisdom. The knowledge, the marriage of knowledge and virtue. That what we know points us to what is right and good and true and just and beautiful and loving. Uh, our prayer should do the same thing. And so when we talk about sacrifice, why are we doing this? Well, there's only four purposes. Adoration, reparation, thanksgiving, and petition. Any questions, problems, difficulties, hassles, mysteries of life, protests, arguments, hostile words, <laughs> embarrassing analogies? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I like you folks. You're remarkably you. placid. Uh, <laughs> I like that. Um, thank you for putting up with my nonsense for another evening. Uh, can I come back? Yeah. Oh, yes. thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, people ask you why you're paying attention to the priest. Um, tell them that it's important to get more than reliable information. It's important to get some guidance in what to do with it. And this is what separates us from other Christians. We have a teaching authority uh, <clears throat> that not everything that you may pull out of scripture is necessarily true. Now I know that way back at the Reformation, the reformers said that the Holy Spirit would inspire each individual believer to understand the truth of the scriptures. It's clear that that has not happened. Period. <clears throat> truth is one, truth can't be different from itself. And if the reformers were right, then there wouldn't be any Protestants. Everybody would be Catholic. Um, and if the reformers were right, it meant that Jesus Christ is incapable of keeping his promises to his church. That we cannot know that with certainty and I know from my own personal experience most of my friends in high school were Unitarians uh, you've heard of the book of the month club they'll send you the book unless you send back the card if you don't send back the card you get the book I call the Unitarians the God of the month club um, they have no teaching authority they have no fundamental core beliefs um, it's basically the ultimate in religious individualism and at the opposite end of that the, the polar opposite is the Catholic Church we are community oriented we believe we only get better together we believe that it is not only possible to know with infallible certitude but that this abides in the community and the community designates teachers who are confirmed by almighty god how does saint saint paul tells us by the imposition of hands so that we may know the truth. Uh, 
this is why the Lord Jesus chose apostles and not publishers. If the Bible contained everything we needed for salvation, he would have gone up and down the length of Palestine handing out copies of the New Testament. There was no New Testament. Uh, it was written by members of the church. And we know from our own experience that no book interprets itself. Not possible. Because religion is not for publishers. Religion is for people. And consequently, if it's not about people and just about a book, then the book is at the mercy of the person who interprets it. And scripture is inspired by Almighty God, but that does not mean that it interprets itself or that anyone who picks up a copy is going to immediately plumb the depths of the wisdom that's there. No. I mean, this is, this is why we have textbooks. You know, it, 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 my favorite analogy is algebra, which I hated. But you walk into a classroom, there are 25 desks, 25 algebra textbooks, message on the board, here are your books, teach yourself algebra. What's missing? There has to be a teacher in the room. Period. We recognize this in public and private education. We recognize it in the role of parents as the primary teachers of their children in everything, especially the ways of faith. No parent is going to hand their child a copy of the New Testament and say, here, worship God. What? Helpful, but it doesn't take the place of the teacher. And that ends my catechism. Any questions, problems, difficulties? <clears throat> no? OK, thank you. Um, anybody have a copy of the syllabus? When do I come back? <laughs>